Ah, Saturday mornings, a bygone pastime that has created many cherished childhood memories. Before the rise of streaming services and 24-hour animation cable channels, the only times allotted for cartoons were on weekday afternoons and Saturday mornings, with the occasional primetime specials and adult animated series, and they would be programmed on various blocks, from the Disney Afternoon, Fox Kids, and Kids WB. But there is one special Saturday morning block and its sister block that holds a special place in many hearts, including yours truly. I'm the Media Nutso, and it's time we pay to revisit to Disney's One Saturday Morning and its sister block, One Two. If you guys enjoy the video, please be sure to leave a like and a comment down below, and if you'd like to see more like it, be sure to hit subscribe and hit that notification bell so you won't miss an upload. And now, on with the show. Our story begins back in 1990 when the Children's Television Act was first signed into law. Yes, I know this is about one Saturday morning and one two, but this is important in how the two blocks came to be. Anyways, for those that don't know about this act, the short version is, when it first came into effect in 1991, the FCC began implementing regulations that required stations and cable networks to air a specific amount of educational content as well as limit commercial time and forbade commercials that promoted products that were tied to the shows during their respective airings. There was just one big issue with it. The initial regulations were pretty ineffective. The stations failed to keep any of the required records, and the act didn't exactly provide a strong and clear definition of what constituted as being educational and informational. Therefore, if a network or station wanted to run, say, the Flintstones or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they could claim they're educational because some episodes tackle specific social and or moral issues, despite the shows clearly not being educational at all. So, in 1996, the FCC adopted the Children's Programming Report and Order, which not only gave a stronger and clearer definition of what qualified to be an educational program, but also ordered that, by September of 1997, all networks had to air at least three hours of educational programming a week. They also had to put up an EI watermark in order to signify it was educational. Okay, now we're really getting into the meat of this story. Just a few months earlier, on February 9th, the Walt Disney Company had officially completed its purchase of the ABC television network from their then-parent company, Capital Cities. Following afterwards, then-Disney CEO Michael Eisner ordered the network to completely overhaul their entire Saturday morning block, but also wanted it to be different from the other children's blocks and have it fully comply within the new regulations. Now, he just needed to get someone that could help bring this new block to life. Enter animation writer Peter Hastings. Hastings was well known as one of the main writers for Animaniacs and Pinky and the Brain. But after getting fed up with Kids WB executives continually wanting to make changes to the latter, he quit Warner Brothers and went over to Disney. When Hastings was brought on board, he was tasked with, as already mentioned, revamping ABC's Saturday morning lineup. So, Hastings pitched them an idea based around the concept that Saturday was different from every other day of the week, which was perfectly represented in the intro, with the industrial factory buildings representing the weekdays, and maybe the park scene at the beginning representing Sunday. He also suggested utilizing virtual sec technology, of which he had little knowledge of at the time, and the tech was just beginning to be developed. But Disney and ABC loved the idea, so he proceeded with the plan. From there, 
he hired Prudence Benton to serve both as a consultant manager and a co-executive producer. They would then attend the 1997 NAB show, sample various virtual set technologies, and would eventually select the tech developed by ACOM and LSET. To help produce the virtual sets, the production company, Rutherford Bench Productions, hired Pacific Ocean Post to do the job. The initial drawing of the building Hastings made was essentially Grand Central Terminal with a roller coaster, but this would morph into a towering mechanical structure. But it would retain some similarities, including having a central high-raised room with an east, west, and south wing. Originally, the park was going to premiere on September 6th. However, because of the extensive coverage of the funeral of Princess Diana of Wales, it got pushed back by one week to September 13th, 1997. Okay, before we get into the block itself, there's one more key person involved in the block's development that doesn't often get mentioned. That person was Geraldine Jerry Laybourne, well known for helping guide Nickelodeon and building it into the big kids network it became during the 80s to mid 90s. She was hired on to develop some of the shows and manage the block. So, now that we've got all that covered, let's head inside and see what this block had to offer. The block was broken up into two parts, three hours worth of regular animated programming and a two-hour sub-block, the titular One Saturday Morning consisting of three shows that were given 40-minute time slots, with the extra 10 minutes consisting of host and educational segments, comedy sketches, and the virtual world as envisioned by Hastings. First up, we have the three main flagship shows, the first of which being Doug, which had premiered the year before. Now, some of you may ask, hold on, Doug was a Nicktoon, how on earth did it wound up with Disney? Well, to elaborate, what happened was that Nickelodeon hadn't picked up the show for a fifth season, which would have pushed the episode count to 65. The big factor being the show didn't become the breakout hit the Nick executives had hoped for and failed to live up to the network's high expectations. So creator Jim Jenkins and his partner co-executive producer David Campbell kept pressuring Nick to renew the show. When that renewal didn't happen, all of the rights reverted back to Jenkins and his company, Jumbo Pictures. But during that time frame, other networks expressed interest in picking up the show, with ABC being among them. At the same time, when Disney finished acquiring ABC, they had also acquired Jumbo Pictures, and with it, all of the show's rights, including for future merchandising and its trademark though Nickelodeon was allowed to retain the rights to the episodes made under their wing, and even made Jenkins and Campbell Disney executives. So, that's how Doug ended up at Disney. Anywho, as far as the show itself, it was made as a direct continuation, picking up where it left off at the end of the fourth season, following more of the daily life of Doug Funny and his friends in the town of Bluffington. When it first premiered on ABC on September 7, 1996, audience and fan reaction was pretty mixed. Many weren't fans of all the changes made for this run, while others felt it was good and that it worked as a continuation. But regardless of what many thought of this run, there was no question it was a huge hit, to the point where it briefly became ABC's biggest Saturday morning show. Naturally, with that kind of success, it was brought over to one Saturday morning and was made one of the block's flagship shows. Next up, we've got Pepper Ann, created by Sue Rose and based on a comic strip she had done for Young and Modern Magazine. The series centered on the title character and all of the trials and tribulations she goes through with her friends and family in the town of Hazelnut. It was originally pitched to Nickelodeon to be the next potential Nicktoon, but they passed on it. However, Snippets of the pilot can be seen in some of the early promos. You go, girl. The show was notable for being the very first Disney animated series to be created by a woman, and it wouldn't be for another 15 years that they get more shows created by women. 
Another important person involved with Pepper Ann was Tom Warburton, aka Mr. Warburton, who was the lead character designer. Last, but definitely not least, we've got Recess. Created by Paul Germain and Joan Salabert, the show focused on six fourth graders as they go about various exploits occurring in Third Street School. Out of the three flagship shows, this was the one that became the big breakout hit. So much so, it continued airing even after the block would get revamped. All three series went on to last for 65 episodes, which was the standard for most Disney animated series at the time. Funny enough, despite one verse in the theme song saying, All three shows have their characters attending school. It's just a rather ironic juxtaposition. The other new additions to the block that first year were 101 Dalmatians the series, based on the 1961 animated classic, and also made to capitalize on the 1996 remake, and Science Court. Created by Tom Snyder and animated in his signature Squiggle Vision style, it tackled science through a mix of courtroom drama, humor, and various science experiments. The show was notable for being one of the few non-Disney produced shows to air on the block. There were also a few shows that were carried over from the previous lineup. Along with Doug, there was The New Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, which was long out of production but continued to do well on the network, and also to fulfill the EI requirements, Jungle Cubs, a kidified spinoff which acted as a prequel to The Jungle Book, Schoolhouse Rock, which had been a big ABC Saturday morning staple since 1973, and The Bugs Bunny and Tweety Show, which really only stuck around because of contractual obligations from before Disney acquired ABC. It at first remained at a full hour, but then got cut down to a half hour during its final year on the block. Oh, but the block had much more to offer than just the shows. There were also the host segments and the interstitials. For the former, they were hosted by Charlie, played by Jessica Purnell for the first season, but was then later replaced by Mimi, played by Valerie Mae Miller, and her elephant sidekick, Jelly Roll, voiced by the late Brad Garrett for seasons 2 and 3. As for the latter, they comprised of Great Minds Think for Themselves, featuring the genie, voiced by Robin Williams, presenting various facts about certain historical figures and inventors, Mrs. Munger's Class, basically a series of conversations between the titular teacher and her students shown via Adobe animated yearbook photos, which was later succeeded by Centerville, which was essentially the same thing, but it takes place in the titular Centerville and is done to the tune of a drumbeat. In your seats! In your seats! In your seats! Anybody who stands up is going to military school! I'd like that! They have lots of sports! Yeah! Like beat up the new kid! What's the diff? Where you, well, spot the difference between two pictures, how things work, a parody of comic books and 1950s educational films, where a man, Mr. Works, voiced by Corey Burton, gives a very nonsensical explanation of how certain things work, Manny the Uncanny, starring Paul Rugg, exploring various subjects. The Two Dwellers, showing the many adventures of two workers both named Bob working inside a television set. How Much Stuff Could an Elephant Crush, where Jelly Roll does exactly what the title says, and Find Out Why. Hosted by Timon and Pumbaa, where Pumbaa asks a question, Timon gives a very outlandish answer to said question, and then the former explains how the subject matter works. Within a few weeks of its premiere, one Saturday morning came out of the gate strong, as it immediately became a huge hit, and for a time, it was beating out Fox Kids and Kids WB in the ratings, though the only exception from the former was Power Rangers. So with how successful the block was doing, Disney wanted to create a companion block, so they began making a deal with UPN, which was relatively easy as the head of the network at the time, Dean Valentine, was a former Disney executive. And after some tough back and forth negotiations, 
they made an agreement for Disney to produce a two-hour block on weekdays and Sunday mornings, which was to be called Warptastic. But for the sake of having a greater brand identity, it was changed before it launched. On September 6, 1999, UPN Kids was out, and Disney's 1-2 was in. While it mainly showcased many of the shows from the parent block, the one difference between them is that, instead of having host segments like one Saturday morning had, one two would have short gag segments based around Doug, Pepper Ann, Recess, and Sabrina the Animated Series. It also utilized a futuristic city for its bumpers, styled to match the main one Saturday morning building. Also, for a time, new episodes would premiere on both blocks, so one would get new episodes across the whole week. Alright, back on to one Saturday morning. Over time, like many blocks, the lineup went through various changes. For the 1998-99 season, Jungle Cubs concluded its two-season run earlier in the year and was replaced by Hercules the Animated Series, which was also airing in syndication. And in the spring, to coincide with Mickey Mouse's 70th anniversary, they came out with the anthology series Mickey Mouse Works, which sought to revive the classic Mickey Mouse cartoons, and was also the first Disney animated series to be produced in widescreen. Also, their run of Doug concluded that spring, but it would continue to play in reruns for the next couple of years, and Science Corp was retitled Squiggle Vision in an attempt to make it more appealing, and introduced new segments, hosted by two kids, Fizz and Martina who were previously featured in their own series of educational games. I hope Butcher shows us where the Gold Star landed. We'll be the only ones in Blue Falls who know about it. The only thing is, I don't know how late I can stay out. Me neither. My parents said they might need me tonight to help them with the tracker. Hey, Martina, what's an eight-letter word that begins with a D and means constant in effort? I know. What? Guess. But I don't know. Fizz, think. It means constant in effort or working hard and steady. The next season, 101 Dalmatians the series was done, and in its place was Sabrina the Animated Series, produced by DIC Animation, and also acted as a spin-off to the live-action Sabrina the Teenage Witch. An interesting story about its addition is that, before Disney purchased ABC, their then-parent company, Capital Cities, made a joint venture with Deke where they had 95% of the majority stake, while Deke's co-founder, Andy Hayward, had 5%. Thus, when Disney bought ABC, they had also purchased their stake in Deke. So, it became a Disney subsidiary for a short time. But they did treat Sabrina as if it was one of their own. Anyways, the other new show added that year was The Weekenders. As mentioned earlier, the Bugs Bunny and Tweety show was cut down to a half hour this season, and would end its long run in August of 2000, which was really no big loss as they were already continually playing on Cartoon Network at this point. Lastly, Squiggle Vision came to an end after Season 3 finished, and Schoolhouse Rock would conclude its long time run. Now, it was around this time where the two blocks began their decline. Not that the new shows added were terrible, but it wasn't pulling in the audience as it did before, and it can all be attributed to just one thing. Tough competition. By this point in time, Kids WB really started to ramp up its lineup with some heavy hitters, including Men in Black the Series, Batman Beyond, Jackie Chan Adventures, and especially when they picked up Pokemon from syndication. And it doesn't need to be said how phenomenally huge it was. But needless to say, it was a huge blow to one Saturday morning and one two. Not to mention, Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon also had their own heavy hitters going on as well. Now, this isn't to say they didn't have any victories after that. 
Probably one of their biggest was when The Weekenders dethroned Pokemon as the number one rated Saturday morning show in May of 2000, after the latter held the spot for 54 weeks. Granted, it didn't last for too long, but it was still pretty significant. And while Fox Kids was able to get by with Power Rangers and found another big hit with Digimon, it wasn't enough to help the block beat out one Saturday morning. The 2000-2001 season was sort of a transitionary period. At the beginning, it was still mostly the same as it was up until that point, but by the winter, there were some significant changes, like the intro and interstitials were revamped, now showing kids playing outside either at a playground or just in a big field, with animated characters presented via stock footage, the bumpers featuring the anthropomorphized one building were out and instead made the one more of a character, and was the only newly animated thing, and the two hour subwalk was discontinued completely. As for the shows, both Doug and Pepper Ram would leave the block, and some new shows would take their place, like Teacher's Pet, Buzz Lightyear of Star Command, which also joined 1 2, Lloyd in Space, and, to coincide with Walt Disney's 100th birthday, Mickey Mouse Works was revamped into House of Mouse, which basically reran almost every Mouse Works short plus two new ones, but now have wraparound segments where Mickey and the gang run a nightclub featuring every character the studio made up until that point, and predictably, chaos ensues. As for 1-2, it too did away with all its segments and virtual sets, and their place were just commercial bumpers for each show. It also stopped being referred to by name, though it did continue to be mentioned in a few commercials. And it premiered one new show that didn't air on one Saturday morning, The Legend of Tarzan. But the 2001-2002 season, Recess would end production but continue to play in reruns of both blocks, Sabrina the Animated Series would leave one Saturday morning in October, and, in a vain attempt of synergy to promote Disney Channel's programming, they introduced a one-hour block called The Zoo Gower, where they showed two of the Disney Channel's biggest shows at the time, Even Stevens and Lizzie McGuire. However, that wasn't the only new addition. There was also Mary Kay and Ashley in Action, which only ran one season due to low ratings, and was also the last new non-Disney animated series to premiere on the block, and Timo Supremo in January of 2002. By the end of the season, around sometime after Disney had purchased Fox Family Worldwide, it was decided to relaunch the block to have it air both reruns of Disney Channel shows and newer original shows. So, on September 7th, 2002, one Saturday morning aired for the very last time and would be relaunched as ABC Kids the following week. By the way, the most ironic part about the relaunch was that ABC had already gone ahead and renewed all of the shows before the change occurred. So, Disney ended up airing the new episodes exclusively on Toon Disney, though Timo Supremo locked out and got to air the second half of Season 2 on ABC Kids before it got dropped. Anyways, on the other end, 1-2 would continue to air for one more year, but by that point, the name was dropped altogether and was never given an official rebrand. Though Disney's official website referred to it as the very generic sounding Disney's Animation Weekdays. The only new addition to the lineup was Digimon, which was also airing on ABC Family. From there, it limped along until it officially ended on August 31st, 2003. Fortunately, the shows continued to live on through reruns on Disney Channel and Toon Disney for a good number of years, and most recently, many of them have found a new home on Disney+, Plus, with more of them coming in the near future. In conclusion, Disney's One Saturday Morning and One Two were creative and imaginative blocks, with great shows, fun skits and segments, and did a fairly good job at being educational for the time. Despite their relatively short lifespans, 
they've left their impact on many childhoods and are following up back with great nostalgia. I hope you all enjoyed this video and that it gave you a great and fun nostalgic blast from the past. Thank you.